We are live. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. You have reached Saturday Science Chats. Hey, 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 this is David Hilscher, and I'm with the John Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society and, of course, Dissident Science. And today we are going to be having a first and a part three, a part one of a part three series. And this is in, uh, uh, continuing our evolving perspectives on the history of science. And this one is time and physics, something that if you love physics and cosmology and science in general, it's almost impossible for you not have to have thought about what time is. And of course, we've got one of the foremost experts on the planet Earth, at least we say planet Earth, Nick Percival's, who's here. It's going to be just great. I love I love Nick, um, and we'll talk about that in, coming up. But at first, I want to congratulate you for even tuning in, because if you are watching this, that means you are a person who is a critical thinker. See my T-shirt right here? Critical thinking is very important. And as Aristotle or someone else has said, because I've been told that maybe Aristotle didn't say this, but hey, it's fun anyways. It's a great saying, and that is it's a mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. And by the way, if you are watching this intro and you want to get to Nick right away, just fast forward because this is recorded. Go forward and start his uh, lecture. But this is for those people who haven't been here before. So again, you have that option always when you are watching this recorded. And please please like and subscribe. It is very important to us because that's how we get more and more people who are watching this channel and more subscribers. In fact, we have over, I want to thank my um, Dissident Science subscribers, Good. coming up to 4,100, coming up to 1,000, still inching our way up there with the John Chappell Natural Philosophy Society. And so we're really, uh, I want to thank each and every one and congrats for watching this because this is a place where you're going to hear critical thinking. Um, and also a couple other things I'm putting here. And as you, you got to remember, folks, we're all in this together. I know a lot of times we have people even in the chat who are just like attacking. It's like, folks, we have to um, all remember that the let's fight the illogical mainstream science and not ourselves. Support your fellow critical thinker, even if you don't agree with them. At least agree to say, hey, people are going on a limb to do, do write a book or to talk about something or thought many, many years as, as Nick has on time. So guys and gals, please just, you know, remember the, the big picture here. And also the other thing I want you to try to remember, and this is not easy either. So you know me, I am the, the physics police. So I'm going to get right on your case. And we are all wrong. Every one of us, all of us. And the way my dad has put it, um, I'll quote him whether he wants to be quoted or not, or I'll just give him the quote. But basically, some ideas are less wrong than others. That's pretty much what we are we do as human beings. Um, this idea that everything is absolute, everything is understood. Yeah, we have a lot of things like, you know, the atomic structures, we're pretty, we understand a lot about that. But we don't even know really what's going on as much as we think we do. But but I think the other thing is too, when dissidents, we dissident scientists have our own ideas, um, you're, you, you're an etherist, or you believe in a lattice, or we have our particle model, for instance, or you have a new atom way that atomic structure works. Please remember, just don't fall in love with it. Because the moment someone comes up to you with a, a legitimate criticism, you, you're, you're going to be looking really silly if you really don't do that as a habit in general to realize that, yeah, this is a, these are neat ideas. These are great ideas, but they're all wrong, just less wrong. Um, welcome. Hey, good morning, Richard Jush from Berkeley. Uh, thanks for tuning in. And uh, again, we uh, thanks to everybody tuning in live here. All right, let's keep going. <laughs> And of course, our mission is to, to promote critical thinking without malice, meaning you can publish and we help publish, promote scientific work outside of mainstream in mathematics, cosmology, physics, etc. We po provide a forum to discuss and present serious papers and theories without fear of with uh, fear of censorship. And we're, we are completely run by our members. 
we do have websites and you should check them out if again if this again you can fast forward to the main event here but if not it's your first time here uh you can go to beyondmainstream.org if you have no idea that's that mainstream science is a lot bigger mess than you think in fact we're in model crisis is what i call it right now in the kunian uh, terms um, and you can check it out there and it's like a magazine so you can read it's really cool you can le learn about all the people and the great critical thinkers out there including Nick's on there um, and all kinds of articles that are very interesting also our community naturalphilosophy.org critical thinking community um, it's very active lately which is great we have software for that and uh, really great software we're using uh, buddy boss I think it's called and uh, so that's really a lot of fun easy to participate we have lots of groups and discussions going on there you can see them and of course we have our wikipedia with over 10,000 pages to check uh, check out now um i'm going to uh, uh oh uh, let me get out of here i want to show you guys what's going on don't say there you go this is our website for our community you can see here that um oh there my dad posted a new video this morning here is the uh, video for today, but you can see here um, uh, people uh, discussing things sort of like, almost like Facebook. And again, we uh, rent, we uh, pay subscription to this. It's really great software. And you can see there, these are groups over here, kinds of groups and here are the people you can subscribe to our newsletter. There are some of the people there who have been discussing lately and all the different groups that you can join in. You can have your own profile there and everything uh, uh, for instance, here you can see my profile. Each person has that, and uh, you can go there and find out what they're saying, blog articles, etc. So you do want to check that out. It's a it's a lot of fun, uh, and, and if you are really into um, uh, discussing and meeting other people, it's really great. I thought I'd show that to you today, um, and also very very important. And I really do appreciate because I see people joining newly every almost every week. Um, we do live off of our memberships and our donations. We have monthly memberships and I want to, uh, and we also have annual memberships and we do get donations from people, generous donations. We have about $2,300, $2,300 a year for everything from the stream, this platform you're watching now to that website you saw, the server for the, for, for the website. This is all publicly, no publicly, it's owned by the members who, who do uh, help out and we need your help. We barely get by and uh, that's okay. But we, if you can spare five bucks a month, that would be great. If not 35 bucks a year, it helps every person. If they give a little, it's going to mean a lot to us. I want to thank our patrons. Nick Percival is one of them. He's going to be speaking today. He's been a patron. I want to greatly thank him for his his uh, generous uh, uh, givings to our, uh, our our group. Dr. Cynthia Whitney as well. Uh, Ramsey pen name and of course all of our annual and monthly memberships. And we need your vital support. And the word uh, optimal word there is vital. Vital means. Uh, life and death, life keeps us alive. Um, so that's really important. So please, coming soon next week is going to be really great as well as many other things are coming. We already have uh, things lined up. Next week, we will be here three hours later. So if you're on the East Coast, we'll start at 1. If you're on the West Coast, it'll start uh, at 10 a.m., which is really great. And if you are in Hawaii, like Tao Lin, take a look at uh, look him up, Tao Lin, uh, author, um, Pretty well known. He's been written up in magazines in New York City and uh, London. Um, uh, really, really a great guy. He has also written uh, papers about alternative models, and he actually watches this. So if you're out there, Talon, it's great to great to have you as a patron. Uh, patron watching this, keep critically thinking. And of course, Nick Percival will be having special relativity time actually talk to um, I probably get the it doesn't matter it's about time and special relativity he's gonna have three talks all together my dad's gonna be coming back talking about the physicality of parallel resistors diodes and transistors how he as an electrical engineer has really embraced and gotten to um, understand uh, what possible models could be made for the physicality of of electronic components. We use them all the time, but all we have are empirical equations that have nothing to do with reality. And I put this down here because I know I'm just going to get slings and arrows of from everybody for even saying this, but yep, I am going to host a great debate and I'm going to be on the 
ether doesn't exist side and i'm very i'm welcoming anybody who wants to debate me on that again a very cordial debate i will for i will un, okay i'm going to tell you i do not cannot say that ether for sure doesn't exist i don't think it's a good model i think there's a, too many flaws with it but does it exist it could that's the way you have to have an attitude if i was a betting man no i think there, there's a better model out there that's okay but we're going to debate it and i'd love to, if you are interested in being on the other side of that debate then um contact me and of course uh ian cohen is to um blame for this so um if you don't like that especially after we do it and you don't like it um i will give you his email address so you can send it to him but uh anyways great guy it was a great suggestion so i'm going to put that one out there because i'm ready for that one i've got some, i've got a couple arguments that i think are going to be fun to look at but again we're also going to be doing debates on other things so if you're interested in that kind of format contact me and um We'll go forward, but we're going to now get to our main event here t uh, today, which is on our series of call uh, what we call evolving perspectives on the history of science. Now, let me explain a little bit about this. Nick was very helpful in this, as were a couple other people. And what that really means is we are looking, we critical thinkers, people of like myself and Nick and Ian and my dad and many, many hundreds of people, thousands of people around the world who've been looking as critical thinkers, mainstream science, really realizing all the problems. We've been looking at this for many, many years, and we end up developing a different perspective of history. That is when we go and look at Einstein's relativity, for instance, we don't look that like, we don't look at it like mainstream does saying that was a paradigm shift. To me, that was actually a model shift and a start of what what is a crisis in in science so to me and many 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 dissidents relativity started a crisis in science it wasn't a paradigm shift because it's got more problems than it supposedly answers so again that's what this is a this is about that is we critical thinkers when we look at history what the history of light the history of gravity the history of time we look at it a lot differently in my opinion in a more uh objective way because we're not afraid to say everybody's wrong we're just maybe less wrong than before and so in this same vein we're going to be talking about time and physics something that this man has uh, looked at for many years but let's talk about him give you a little bit of his background he is a uh, nick percival's american scientist and uh, entrepreneur who is best known for his work criticizing explaining einstein's theory of rel uh, of theory of relativity's treatment of time so that's why you can imagine nick graduated from harvard with a degree in physics so there you go on one of the criticisms we get is like you don't have a degree you have to go to school. What they really say is you've got to be schooled in the way we think, and then you won't be so uh, critical, which is terrible. It's, it's like what the opposite of what universities should do. He has spent more than 50 years focusing on twin, the twin paradox, and from those studies has come to know the many problems with special relativity, and also about time, of course. I, I put these together here. As an entrepreneur, Nick started several companies in the late 1990s when the internet was really just starting. He co-founded a teacher web at that time, goal providing teachers and educators as a easy way to create and update websites for communicating with students and parents, with students and parents, yep. And of course, I did this uh, for you, Nick. Uh, I, if he has a um, YouTube channel with amazing videos. If you haven't checked it out, um, you should. Um, he calls it the nick of time, which I think is obviously very clever. And you can get there. You don't know how to get there. Well, I made it easy for everybody. You just got to go to nick dot, uh, uh, nick dot natural philosophy dot org. That is, if you go to nick dot uh, type that in any browser, that'll get you to this um, YouTube channel with Nick. And he, he's going to have these videos will be available after uh, today. Um, so uh, you want to definitely check that out. So uh, I'm going to bring up our guests for today before we uh, he gives his presentation. And everybody, welcome Nick uh, Percival. How are you doing? Pretty good. I look uh, a lot different than that picture that. Oh, had me before. too. <laughs> look at me. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, no, but you still, your face is absolutely recognizable and uh, you've just, you just look more wise. We just, you know, that's, that's not a problem. So tell me, um, tell the audience who, who don't know you at all, how did you get involved with the idea of time and even caring about it? Most people uh, don't want to give time any time at all. Uh, <laughs> Give, give us, you know, give us, give the person a background why you came into it. I think that's really important. Well, at Harvard, I took a course on special relativity. And then I saw in Life magazine, it said that uh, because of special relativity's time dilation, the astronauts would come back to the Earth younger. Uh, I didn't dispute that they would come back younger, but... Um, special relativity actually didn't predict that. So I brought that attention to my uh, professor, and I thought we had come to an understanding. Uh, incidentally, when I was taught special relativity, I saw that flaw, you know, without thinking about it, and thought that he was talking about a more sensible theory. Anyways, um, I, I left... Uh, the academic physics world, but have uh, remained having uh, physics as a hobby. So you, you you left it. Were you thinking about going into it, or were you discouraged? Yes, I was thinking about going into it. Yeah. Wow! So you were discouraged by very early its irrationality, or well, and also I was intrigued by computers, and I eventually I went in like you. I went into computers and the software right. development. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about, first of all, uh, your series, and then second of all, just give us a brief introduction what we'll see today in part one here. Okay. I don't have, a, you know, a total theory of my own. I, I just focused on both from a logical point of view, special relativity cannot be describing the physical world and what's happening physically. And that's what physics is supposed to be about. Um, and I sort of realized that um, despite my conversation with the physics professor that I talked about earlier, that, gee, the, the academic physicists have this uh, crazy interpretation of special relativity, at least part of the time. Sometimes they shift to a totally different interpretation. Um, so I, I thought that was important. I kept working on it and working on it. And then eventually I discovered the NPA, which evolved into the CNPS. And it was great to have uh, a, lot, a lot of other people who thought the same way. So when did you join the NPA? Would you remember? Um, yeah, Greg Volk brought me in oh. maybe around, uh, I actually don't remember. It's 10 years anyway. Right, right. So it's and not back too in long. The Back right. in the NBA days. Right. So you, you you weren't there from the beginning, though. Not from the beginning, no. no. Right, right. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So tell us a little bit about what we're going to see today. Okay. I've, I've um, <clears throat> It's a relatively short video, only 45 minutes. Um, I give an intro, so I've covered most of the details. I'll just add a couple of thoughts. One, the charts, uh, the, the title line has a number on it. That number is basically... Uh, for me, you'll find that uh, they don't go in sequence and there are gaps between them. But you can use that number as a shorthand to ask a question, like on chart 15, bullet 3, I have this question, and uh, that will help me. Um, also, the first, this first presentation is a little bit mundane, at least for some of the CNPS listeners, um, but it provides the conceptual base for truly understanding parts two and three. To me, uh, this is just one long presentation and uh, the whole uh, makes sense together. Uh, so just focus on the what's happening conceptually. If I give the wrong date for something or are left out uh, one of the scientists in the past couple thousand years, uh, <laughs> don't bring that up in the Q and A because I don't want to distract other people. Right. I want to keep in mind keep in mind what the key concepts are that we're going to carry on to part two. Okay, that's and really with great. With that, we can go to the video. Okay, well here's the video, and um, we will get it started. 
Welcome. The topic is the past, present, future of time in physics. That's a very broad and sweeping topic and couldn't be covered in one presentation. So this is part one where we will look at the history of time in physics. Um, part one happens to be a, a redo of a talk that I gave to the CNPS back in 2014 and is also talk number 29 in my Nick of Time YouTube channel, uh, giving a series of 33 talks on uh, time and physics. So we're going to look at the history of time in physics to the millennia. Um, and we're not going to look at those debates on the, from the philosophers about uh, time, as those debates were much too vague and could not come up with a concrete enough construct to uh, use in a physics model. So we're not only going to talk about the history of time and physics, but the perspective will be from a mainstream physicist, namely Professor Lee Smolin, uh, who also uh, is really giving the consensus opinion about the history of time and physics. And we'll end up with a high-level conceptual discussion of special relativity and general relativity's view of time. And then in part two, where we talk about the present uh, of time and physics, we will delve into that topic on, on relativity a lot more deeply, including the evolution from 19th century uh, physics to Einstein's paper in 1905. And that should be extremely insightful and give you much greater understanding uh, of relativity. Since much of this talk will be based on Professor Lee Smolin's ideas, uh, we need to know more about him, including his biases, etc. He's a highly respected mainstream physics professor in academia who loves relativity. In addition, he's also a critical thinker. He wrote a book criticizing string theory as being too much math fantasy and not enough of hard physics. He also wrote the book Time Reborn, which is an excellent book that I recommend to all. And uh, it's the basis for this first talk. We'll start off with a summary of that book. The main thesis is that the concept of time has been slowly removed from physics. Einstein claimed that the distinction between past, present, and future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. And that thought is certainly contained in both special and general relativity. So this removal of time from physics, uh, the peak to date anyways, is in relativity. So Lee recommends that time needs to be put back into physics, and especially for cosmology and quantum gravity. Lee starts off by describing ancient intuitive views. Now, if one's standing on the Earth, one has no sense that the Earth is rotating about its axis or orbiting around the sun, so the intuitive concept is the Earth is at rest, and that P 
people are at rest, except when they're walking or moving with respect to the Earth's surface. So their view was that and not only common everyday humans, but the scientists and physicists of the time, the concept was that the sun, the moon, the planets, the stars all moved with respect to the stationary Earth. Also, and this is quite important, that the passage of time was defined in terms of those motions or those astronomical processes. The day was thought to be the time, naively thought to be the time, that the sun makes a full rotation around the earth, whereas in reality uh, it's really that the earth is making one rotation about its axis, and the week is seven rotations about the earth's axis, and an hour is one twenty-fourth of the time it takes for the Earth to rotate once around its axis. And even the month is approximately the, the corresponds to the moon going through its various phases. In addition, uh, the ancients thought of there being two separate worlds. The celestial realm was unchanging and had perfect repeating pattern, patterns versus the realm of the imperfect chaotic earth. They consider them two quite different separate realms. Here's a picture of that ancient view with the earth at the center and all the celestial bodies going in perfect circles around the earth including the moon, the sun, all the planets, and all the stars. And to the degree that they are, the precision of their observation of the time, it worked out pretty well. So that's the picture of Ptolemaic astronomy. And Lee makes the point regarding that and geocentrism is there's a lesson here which is that neither mathematical beauty nor agreement with experiment can guarantee that the ideas a theory is based on bear the slightest relation to reality. I would contend that regarding relativity, uh, that lesson was completely ignored by Lee, as we'll discuss later on. So the Ptolemaic view continued to evolve, like science is always evolving. Uh, sometimes it goes down the wrong path even, but it's always changing. So the view was that the heavenly bodies always moved in perfect circles around the earth. But then they found that there were some retrograde motion. So that nice simple picture became more complex as they had to add 55 circles to uh, take into account retrograde motion. But they were still stuck on <laughs> circles because that was considered the perfect symmetric shape. Then Tycho Brahe came along and made another step forward. He said that the planets travel around the sun, and that yielded a much simpler picture. But, because his belief in the Earth-centered view was so strong, he couldn't make that next step. Uh, so he said that, well, the sun still moves around the Earth. He assigned uh, Kepler, to analyze the orbit of Mars and Kepler, doing careful work, saw that that orbit was really an elliptical orbit and not a circular orbit. And uh, 
He made a great jump and change in paradigm and saw that it, the Earth was also moving around the sun. Now everything, all the planets were moving around the sun. So that really was quite a major change in astronomy, a, a paradigm change. But it also was a great change in terms of time, in terms of the underlying model of time, because in the geocentric view, a day was the sun making one revolution uh, around the Earth. But the true physics was that the underlying motion, the underlying process of the day was the Earth making one revolution about its axis. Okay, having covered a couple of thousand years of physics, we come to Galileo, and he was the first one to discover that the motion of all thrown objects follows a simple type of a math curve, a simple geometric object. Uh, the parabola, the math definition is that it's the loci of points that are equidistant from a specific point and a specific line. And the equation is simply y equals x squared. It's a static equation describing the entire parabola at once, and there's uh, no t for time in there. So at least uh, scientists now are beginning to apply uh, and see patterns in what happens in the realm of the Earth, not just celestial objects. So, back in the days of the Ptolemaic picture, we had everything orbiting in circles, and then we advanced to seeing the orbits as ellipses, and now we have Galileo introducing a parabola to describe so an objects, but all of those pictures are static in the sense that they show the entire uh, motion or process as all at once. So Lee's point is that um, physics was really treating a dynamic process as a static math object, where the geometric objects give a static picture of the whole phenomenon at once, and the same for uh, equations. So Lee went on to say the math is timeless, pure thought, unchanging, um, and there's no place for observation or measurement. For instance, in the, for the parabola, uh, the parabola was discovered purely from uh, math manipulations, and it was only after the fact that it was applied to thrown objects. But if you're just thinking in terms of math and can use any of the many math manipulation, that can lead to fantasies uh, because you're not being tied to the physicality of the real world. And regarding time, this treatment of dynamic processes as static math objects was really the first step to spatialization and geometrization of time. Uh, spatialization means treating time as though it were uh, another spatial dimension. And that, <laughs> that tendency was fully realized in relativity. Moving ahead a couple of centuries, we come to Newton. And his key constructs for time are absolute time and absolute predetermination. Regarding the latter, Newton said that, well, given the initial position of all particles and their initial velocity and the forces 
that exist, then everything is predetermined. So that view pictures everything really as a static whole. The universe had become timeless in Newton's model, an unchanging solution. Time was really replaced by computation. And again, Lisa Lee's views, uh, basically everyone I've read about this period uh, says the same thing. Regarding absolute time, um, the model really pictures like there's some universal clock, maybe even outside the universe, that uh, progresses at a consistent pace throughout the universe. It's independent of any observer and separate from absolute space. We jump forward 150 years or so to special relativity, which gets rid of time in physics in many ways. First of all, it replaces absolute time with relative to the observer time. And if you read the 1905 paper, it's very interesting that there's no attempt by Einstein to say, oh, here's the reasons with absolute time, and here's the benefits of going to relative to the observer time. Uh, and that is mostly true in terms of the physics community. You might assume that such a dramatic change in a paradigm would be at least debated or even if everyone instantly agreed that they would enumerate all of the benefits of this change but no some peripheral comments of course but in general no we would just accept it uh, furthermore Einstein redefines time in terms of the speed of light and assumes that the speed of light is constant for all observers in all inertial frames for both the speed of light approaching those observers and the speed of light receding from all those observers. And this is implemented into special relativity in the following way. If you're gonna use special relativity in an inertial frame, you have to synchronize your clocks using Einsteinian synchronization, which goes like this. You send a signal from clock A to clock B, and it, that signal is sent back to clock A. When it gets to A, A notes the total time for that clock, uh, for that round trip of light. It then divides that total time in half by assuming it takes the same amount of time to go from A to B as it does to have light go from B to A, regardless of the motion of that inertial frame. So if you do that, if you synchronize your clocks that way, regardless of physical reality, then you're guaranteed to measure the speed of light as being uh, a constant C, whether that light wave is going away from A towards B or towards A from B. So the net result is that time equals the length of the path that it's traveled divided by C. Time is defined in terms of the speed of light and assumes that the speed of light is constant for all inertial frames. The mathematician Hermann Minkowski, who had taught uh, Einstein math in the past, uh, showed that Einstein's 
special relativity equations were equivalent to Minkowski space-time diagrams. In these diagrams, we'll see that time can morph into space and space can morph into time. Uh, so one selects a particular uh, inertial frame and has the black axes representing the time and x direction in space. But for another frame that's moving with respect to the black frame, let's call it the blue frame, um, there's a different view of what's time and what's space. Those axes are rotated by the angle alpha shown here, which is a function of the relative velocity between the blue frame and the black frame. So time, which is multiplied by the speed of light to have it measured in terms of meters, just like the X frame, time in one frame becomes space in another, and space in one frame becomes time in another. So if we shift and have the blue axis now called the stationary frame and the black axis is moving, of course, the same speed relative to the z-axis, then we have a mirror image of this picture showing how uh, time of one morphs into the space of another and vice versa. Still another way that special relativity gets rid of time in physics is the construct of relative simultaneity. Each inertial frame and or inertial observer has their own idiosyncratic view of what's simultaneous. For example, for some event X that A observes as being simultaneous with his present present state. There will be another observer who sees X as simultaneous with an event in A's future, and a third observer who sees X as simultaneous with an event in A's past. Hence, in special relativity, there's no global past, present, future. Each observer has their own construct of past, present, future, and of what's simultaneous. Sometimes the picture helps. So we'll look at this admittedly uh, crude diagram, and we have in special relativity, Marie is the observer, so her time axis is perfectly vertical, and her space axis is perfectly horizontal. And she's at point A, which is a uh, zero time and zero uh, distance on the horizontal axis. Now event X happens on that horizontal axis, so Marie sees X, event X, is simultaneous with her current uh, present. However, we have Freddie. Freddie is moving at some velocity with respect to Maria, so his time and space axes are rotated with respect to Maria's in special relativity. And B, um, Freddie is at event or location B in this space-time diagram, and Freddie sees X as being simultaneous with some uh, point that's in Maria's future. So they have totally disagreements of is X in the present or is X in the future, even, even within Maria's diagram. And of course, uh, we could have another observer who sees event X as being in Maria's past. So everyone has a different view of past, present, and future. 
Lee continues, special relativity, general relativity, gets rid of time. In the relativistic universe, it's like a timeless unity. The flow of time is an illusion. Relativity's reality is there's no global past, present, or future. All there is is a four-dimensional space-time, which time is not separate from space. And that four-dimensional space-time is like a frozen block of ice. In special relativity's construct of space-time, in Einstein's words, space and time are subjective ways of dividing up a four-dimensional reality. In relativity, the universe is a mathematical, geometric object called by all well, the block universe view. General relativity is even more timeless than special relativity. It confirms the block universe view and the construct of past, present, future only has local observer-dependent meaning in the same sense as the terms here, left, right, and near describe location in space relative to an observer. General relativity is about the geometry of four-dimensional space-time, where the key construct is its 4D metric. And most interesting, and I think quite important, is that Einstein himself was distressed that the now, the present, and the sense of past and future was absent from physics theory, and thought that this was a shortcoming, but in the context of relativity, saw no possible resolution. As a quick aside, I'll note that Lee brings out that quantum mechanics is also timeless and compatible with special relativity's relative simultaneity. However, uh, the alternatives to quantum mechanics, such as the hidden variable theories uh, of de Broglie and Bohm and Vigier, require absolute simultaneity. I had not known that before reading uh, Lee's book, but I'd always had a preference for the alternative theories. They seem to be inherently more physical. Okay, on the theme of time has been removed from physics, or at least the essential properties of uh, time, uh, the past, present, future, simultaneity. Um, we started off by saying there was a freezing of motion when it was transformed into a physics graph or into a static physics formula. Um, this abstraction uh, with just a view of a the math view gave the picture of the entire process and uh, no hint about its evolving through time. Next was the Newtonian view, which introduced predetermination, which seemed to be like a precursor to the block universe view. Next we had relativity introducing relative simultaneity uh, which meant that there's no global past, present, or future. It's all observer-dependent. And finally, there was the four-dimensional space-time block universe uh, of general relativity, where space and time were welded together. Just to be clear, in case someone is thinking, I've been studying special relativity and uh, a lot of its equations include T. Yes, that's true. Uh, T standing for proper time or um, observed time. But the point is that uh, these 
points on this chart refer to a special relativity's model. And in that model, some of the key properties of what we think about as being inherent in time, like the past, present, future, or, uh, simultaneity have been removed from that special relativity model. Okay, we just summarized Lee's main thesis, uh, namely that the properties of time have been removed from physics, and he considers that a problem. And further, the the ultimate case example of the essential properties of time being removed from physics is relativity. However, he goes on to say um, that he prefers relative time to absolute time. And he references Leibniz, who had his principle of sufficient reason. Leibniz said for questions like, why is the universe like this? There must be a rational answer. There must be a rational reason. So he looks at absolute time and he gives the rhetorical question and answer. Would it matter if the universe started 10 minutes later than it did? And Leibniz says, no. Therefore, time is not absolute. And Lee says, I accept Leibniz's reasoning. Uh, I would just comment that I think Lee was a little too quick <laughs> and uh, perhaps too inclined to accept a rationale for accepting the rationale over the, the absolute. Regarding that second bullet, I think it might prove that when you started the universe with time uh, might be relative, but using Newtonian thinking, whether you start the universe at X or X plus 10 minutes, if you use the same uh, initial parameters, initial conditions, then you could have absolute time in both cases, uh, just absolute with respect to whenever you started the universe. Just a thought. Since we're talking about absolute versus relative, we'll, as an aside, talk about motion. Lee makes the point, if motion is inherently relative, that does present a problem, another problem with relative, in that you can't assign any specific physical cause to that motion. And he further makes the point that geocentrism, which he dismisses as uh, not good physics, rather Rube Goldberg-like model it can only be justified based on relative motion. If all motion is relative, then you, know, you can take a Ptolemaic view of the world, even though the, the model is extraordinarily complex and you have to add 55 adjustments for retrograde motion and have a rather convoluted explanation of the physics of what's going on and driving motion of everything around the earth. So there he concedes to strong arguments uh, against uh, physics viewing all motion as relative. In addition, I'll add my own view that uh, I think there are good arguments that rotational motion and acceleration are absolute because when you start the acceleration or rotational motion, you're introducing forces that weren't there before. So I extrapolate from that 
and say that when you absolute, when you accelerate from x to x plus 50, uh, you're going from one absolute state to another absolute state uh, of constant motion. Now we come to Lee's conclusion. And we'll also look at the challenge for Lee about that conclusion. Lee concludes that time has been removed from physics, as we've seen. But Lee concludes, but at least for certain areas, cosmology, quantum gravity, hidden variable versions of quantum mechanics, needs time. Physics needs time. But that conclusion presents a problem for Lee because his belief system includes special relativity and general relativity, which are timeless. Lee's solution continues. He says we have to give up relative simultaneity and adopt a preferred global time and determine, at least for cosmology, the cosmological preferred state. And Lee further says, the fact that this contradicts the triumph of Einstein over the ether is a psychological barrier to taking the arguments for the reality of time seriously. And finally, he says, on a cosmological scale, preferred frame is valid, but on a smaller scale, relativity prevails. We'll now take a little bit of a deeper look at Lee's solution. He says, even on a cosmological scale, the preferred frame is determined by the actual distribution of matter and gravitational radiation, something that I would agree with. So it's not a throwback to Newton's absolute time. Uh, yes, I'm in favor of absolute time versus relative time, but I, I do not want to go back to Newton's version of absolute time. So Lee continues, however, the day is saved by a new theory, shape dynamics, which gives the same results as general relativity. Now I'll give a few points to compare general relativity with shape dynamics. They both have limitations, but they're kind of complementary. In general relativity, simultaneous Simultaneity has meaning if two events are close, but as separation increases, the meaning of simultaneity decreases. However, in shape dynamics, comparing absolute size has meaning if two objects are physically close, but as separation increases, the meaning of absolute size decreases. So Lee keeps general relativity, but when Lee needs time to be meaningful, Lee just switches to shape dynamics. So Lee's solution, which we've just discussed, seems similar to what I've encountered many times, namely a relativist will claim that relativity is gospel, but he sees a problem in relativity and does an ad hoc fix to relativity. And then his view is uh, relativity is correct, but the rest of the world is not understanding relativity correctly. Uh, they should be moving over to my modified version of relativity. Anyway, um, many relativists see the same problems in relativity, and there are quite a few 
different ones, and usually the relativists will see one, one out of many and to focus on that one. Uh, they say the same problems in relativity that dissidents have articulated, but the two groups have different solutions. The relativists tend to patch with an ad hoc fix, whereas the dissidents slash critical thinkers uh, are inclined to take relativity to the landfill and come up with a totally different approach. So Lee's approach uh, it just strikes me as uh, Rube Goldberg-like by using relativity for some areas of physics, but when the properties of time are really needed, switching over to another theory. I just have the feeling that there must be a, a smoother solution. Okay, we'll wrap up part one with a summary of some key concepts that will be very important to understanding part two and part three. First, time has been slowly removed from physics, culminating in total removal from special and general relativity. And a few charts back, we gave some more detail to that, giving some specific examples. But despite this removal, Lee notes that certain areas of physics need time. For example, cosmology. But both Lee and Einstein and others can't find a way to put the essence of time back into relativity. And the final point is a general point. It's a quote from Lee saying, neither mathematical beauty nor agreement with experiment can guarantee that the ideas a theory is based on bear the slightest relation to reality. An important point for, for this series of talks and for all of physics. And it needs to be remembered if you want to be a critical thinker in physics. Before I go, I'll give you a quick preview of part two. It's a deep analysis of how special relativity evolved from Lorentz ether theory, yielding critical insights into relativity. And we'll do this through the lens of the construct of time that we've talked about in part one. If you're a critical thinker, your view of special relativity will be transformed forever. People are waving at me because they can't hear me. It's my fault because I had myself on mute while I was typing. So um, I apologize. I'm sitting here talking away. My dad's waving to me and thinking I'm talking away. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, it, they got to put it like right on the screen. That'll help me. I'll put that in there, suggestions for this. But um, I'm sorry about that. So, Nick, are you there? Yes. Can okay. you hear me? Yes, you couldn't okay. hear me, and I'm sitting there blaming every, the whole rest of the world, sort of like uh, uh, relativity. But absolutely fascinating. We only had about 100,000 comments during that time, but uh, many of them, especially in the beginning, is uh, this is really the nerdy kind of stuff we people who like science like to talk about, because time is is absolutely uh, fascinating. So um, I just want to um, uh, uh, put something up here that if you want to – if you're in the chat, you can put in the chat either a question or a comment. We'll be able to bring that up. Of course, we have the green room as well. Uh, so uh, if you want to come on live and talk here, you can. We have uh, 10 spaces for you to be in the green room. We can bring you up and you can talk. You don't have to be on video. You can also just be on audio. But um, 
So there was a, a, a lot of, lot of different uh, things I wrote down myself in questions. Uh, but I thought, it, I thought it was interesting how one of the things I really never thought of myself was how relativity just completely removed time. I mean, is it, is it as simple to say that they took time and, and meshed it with space to make this mythical four dimensions? Or how would you, how would you describe that to the average person, how, how relativity removed time completely? Well, there are two aspects of it. One is just what you said. It, they made time in their model into uh, another dimension of space with spatial characteristics. And, uh, but also because they became, they based their theory on, on each and every observer's idiosyncratic view that meant there were an infinite number of conflicting views of what's going on. Um, so that's how time disappeared. Uh, in fact, it sucked out almost all of physics by being so observer centric. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's one of the problems. One of the things that I even got into any of this was with, with Dr. Ricardo Carazzani. And the upshot of his work was basically there are no inertial frames. I mean, this idea yes. that right. you have somehow, I mean, it's contradictory. <laughs> it's a contradictory to itself, right? I mean, if you have an inertial frame on everything that's moving, everything's moving in a sub, I mean, you look at uh, uh, anything in front of you, I've got something in front of me here, that is going to be made of atoms and each atom is moving. So do you have an inertial frame for every one of those and times <laughs> different for, it gets, it's, it's, it goes to the absurd level. Um, let me see, we have a, do we do have a comment here? I think that was interesting about small in here. Let me put that up. It says you are miss, this is just a missing an interpretation of small in his argument. <clears throat> he only says time is removed because of the cosmological principle, which he didn't adhere to. That is the laws of nature don't change in time. Is that what you understood or? No, no, no. If you read the book, it's pretty clear. Okay. And in fact, almost all of those things are quotes from the book. Okay. So, so wh wh why do you think a person may think this, that it, uh, he, uh, because of the cosmological principle? He may have heard uh, Smolin talk in a different context. Okay. Okay. All righty. All right. Um, let's see here. Uh, also, you, you did talk about time when it referred to the Big Bang. I know you didn't talk much about that, like the start of the universe being 10 minutes before or 10 minutes after. Was that just a, a generalized statement or a historical statement? Or I was sort of curious when you had mentioned that. Yeah, that was in the context of Leibniz's rhetorical question and answer, which allegedly uh, proved that uh, everything is inherently relative, including time, which... Uh, I think we'll see later it's not valid. And I was trying to show the error in logic in that particular one, although Lee seemed to accept it. Right, right. Okay, um, let's see if we have some other one um, questions. We have people in the green room, if you wanna wave to me and uh, talk about what you think about time or about the presentation, uh, please uh, say hello. Wave your hand. If you want to come on, you can, again, go to live.naturalphilosophy.org. What that does is you got to put that into your browser. That'll bring you up here, um, and then you can come up and, and talk about it. Now, again, if, if possible, try to address the, the conceptual themes that I talked about because, uh, you know, can't cover 2000 years in detail so oh yeah the left, problem is left, you can are yeah. left out you know so but yeah you can you can easily get off track now um i, I think the, the first theme you talked about is how it's been slowly removed from physics i think relativity seems to be do you see that historically as the extreme the furthest yes. point we've gotten yes. yes okay and what you know when people what was from what I kind of understand from that, the idea is then that mathematics also is culpable when it comes to 
removing time from physics because what we end up doing is looking at it as a calculation we look at it as an equation to predict something but then somehow how is that um removing uh you know just having an equation with time in it is that is that all do you as a person who's thought well, way more than this about this than myself is that also a problem how could it be that just having mathematical equations that are useful actually like with space you know going through space and sending uh objects into space how is that also sort of removing time from the physical world yeah the lee said there were two problems with physics becoming too math oriented because the math tended to shift uh the description of a dynamic process into a static uh math object but he also said and this was in uh, i i did this quote twice and then it was the last bullet on that summary um he says that if you are working in the math world then you can apply many many different legitimate math operations but if your Welcome. model is not not the topic if the oh, model is not constrained to um some physical model then you go off into a fantasy world with uh, with your math manipulations and i think that happens a lot in physics okay so the summary concepts here i'm bringing up your video yeah. is the uh, time has been slowly removed from physics and that's what we're talking about yeah the right third now. and the third bullet was the quote from lee right right yeah. I, well that third quote is pretty phenomenal in general yeah. i mean i mean if even though lee is you know he's probably off on a lot of things uh maybe at the time when he was doing his work it was you know pushing a, a forward but uh this has been repeated over and over and over. I mean, even Sabina Hassenfelder, who uh, left the uh, Large Hadron Collider to write a book entitled Lost in Math. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, this observation has been uh, very, how, how do you say, much uh, uh, seen by many people. Uh, and, and I also think that um, one of the reasons people are turning back to the newer models like Jeff Yee's model, like Borkert's model, like our particle model are, are going back to a physical model right. where you don't worry about relativity. You don't worry about what a person observes. You know, it, let's get to the point where we can even just say what we think light really is before we sit and talk about, you know, uh, transmission of and looking at events. Now, um, two just, examples of that quote are you started with special relativity and general relativity which were built on a false assumption so that it didn't match the empirical data but the academic world used math to create dark fudge factors like dark energy and dark um, matter that they they filled the universe with 95 per sent of the universe with these uh, dark fudge factors yeah it, it, it's it's quite amazing i i still i i i think if you talk to the average person who likes science i mean i've talked to many people who are at, they like science when, when you ask them about dark matter and dark energy that's one of the first things that comes out of the mark yeah when they don't know what it is they just give it the word dark and you know and 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 yet the the the, the community is so hell bent on that that they are they get i don't know i think it's a giant distraction where i've even seen some of the science evangelists out there like uh, neil degrassi tyson saying that the person who discovers the next great nobel prize will be the finding of dark matter and that that is waiting to happen that is just absolutely waiting to happen okay i've yeah, got some the, prob other... the problem is yeah. they'll go and look at another galaxy and say oh we see dark matter again but all they're seeing is the dark fudge factor <laughs> 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 Okay, I've got some people waving in the uh, the green room, so I'm going to bring them up. I saw my dad waving. Hey, Dad, I saw you waving. Uh, is that to say say I'm doing something wrong, or did you actually have a statement there? I can't hear you. Can't hear you. 
Uh, I'm not hearing him. Okay, I'm going to bring him down. Let's get him uh, his settings right. Um, get your settings right, Dad. We'll bring you back. Okay, I did see somebody else waving. I think it was James Keen. Yes? Okay, that's James Keen. Bring you up, James. How are you? I am fine. And, and this was an excellent day uh, for Dave and for Nick to present this. Um, I w put together some ideas while Nick was talking and would like to get his reaction. The ideas are, what if space and time are completely quantized? And we could make the analogy of um, the content of computer RAM is the state. And, uh, in other words, each location is either a one or a zero. Uh, the clock of the computer is the time quanta. It is how often the state of the RAM is changed. And the program of the computer, and basically I'm making an, an analogy between the computer and uh, the universe, okay? So the third and last item is the pro program, uh, which uh, during each clock tick of the computer is performing the time development of the state of the universe, changing which locations uh, in space or in the RAM bits, um, uh, the time development laws uh, is the program. So and you have a cycling program, and that is the universe. Uh, your turn. Okay. I, I've, in the past, uh, you have mentioned about quantization of, of space and time, and I really haven't had a lot of time to think about that particular aspect but i will say in part three i give a physics construct to replace the general concept of time and that just now thinking about it it is quantized but i don't know if it matches 100 percent your concept ah well wonderful i i i like that uh, response a lot um Yes, I can't ask for more, except I'm the big picture is that um, I have found here on um, uh, in this forum and uh, these uh, broadcasts weekly that all of the dissidents, they all believe in continuous space time. And uh, 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 in other words, not uh, well, there's some exception. Franklin, who uh, thinks that that. Uh, uh, space is quantized. You just uh, conceded that perhaps time is quantized. So I'm wondering, my view is that the theory that time is continuous, the space is continuous, is a, an outdated superstition. End of story. Thank you. I'll sign off here and, and listen to your, your comments and give other people a chance to talk. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. James. I love your stuff. Thank you. David? <laughs> yes. Okay. okay. I thought you. I thought you were going to make some more comments no. there. Um, all right. I've got uh, Ian Cohen. Uh, Ian, how are you? Um, Hi, hello. Ian. Uh, not too bad at all. Good. Good, good to uh, see both of you, gentlemen, Nick and David. Um, I I have a, a comment which Nick may, may wish to um, comment on in turn, and then maybe a more specific question. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. My comment is that um, the Minkowski type system, the coordinates they use, um, can be useful in classical physics, you know, irrespective of SRT. So, um, you know, if you have like X1, X2, X3, or the three spatial coordinates X, Y, Z, X4 uh, can be ICT, uh, the square root of minus one times C. Uh, times t time, um, and if you use that fourth coordinate, uh, you uh, you get a sort of a generalized Laplacian, where you know the, the Laplacian equals zero, and and um, in this case you get a, a, a the quad quad squared so, uh, zero uh, equals zero. So so it's a useful system in 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 classical physics. You can get the wave equation from that. Uh, now, the more specific question was, um, you know, this old chestnut uh, about uh, absolute motion. And you had one of the bullets there, Nick, where you you said actually quite clearly that 
um, accelerative or accelerative or ro um, 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 rotational amounts of the same thing, um, motion was absolute. But I think you shied away from saying that ordinary uh, linear motion was accelerative and uh, was, sorry, was absolute. And I, I, I wonder what your view of that is, because you, you, you qualified the acceleration um, by, by saying, well, there are forces applying on that. And I, I'm wondering what your view would be on sort of linear relative motion and whether you can actually attribute some sort of absoluteness to that or not. Yes. Um... I was arguing for absolute motion, and I brought up those two examples of acceleration and rotational motion. And then I said in the video, from that, I extrapolate to think of linear motion as being representing various different levels of absolute motion. So I apply absolute motion to uh, linear motion as well. Uh, oh, oh, okay, so, so, so I, I think I understand now, but in a way, it's almost like, um, you know, the Cantor type, different types of infinity. One, one type of infinity is maybe more extreme than the other type of infinity. So in a way, if unless I'm misunderstanding you, you're saying, well, uh, the, the absoluteness of <laughs> rotational motion is, is maybe more absolute than, than, than the absolute nature of um, linear motion. Well, I just thought it was clearer that, or had a clearer argument that rotational and accelerated motion were were relative. And I didn't have as strong an argument for linear, but I, I extrapolated from those uh, types of motion to including uh, linear motion as being absolute as well. And I think if you're doing physics that's an essential, an essential view. Uh, but further, I don't go with with the Newtonian view of absolute time, because the rate of time or its surrogates depends on the local configuration of mass and energy. Um, there is no single universal clock that drives the entire universe ahead tick by tick. It's a very much of a, uh, the analog or the surrogate for time is very much a local phenomenon and dependent on local physical reality. As, as, Lee, as Lee alluded to himself uh, when he was talking about cosmological physics. Well, I, to finish, I, I think I'll have to give a lot more thought to, to that and I may come back to it with your permission uh, for parts two and three. Um, because um, I, I'm not convinced uh, of that, uh, you know, particularly in regard to time difference. I'm not talking about maybe the starting time or the finishing time, because that can actually vary with physical circumstances. But yeah. as regards to time difference, I, I do tend to use the Newtonian system. So I'm going to give a lot more thought to what you have just said, Nick, and uh, we may come back to this. Uh, as I say, if that's okay. I, I think part three will be listen to part three and then. We can continue this. Okay, very well. Yeah. Th th thank you very much once again. Thanks, Ian. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I clicked on it this time, but I didn't <laughs> click long enough on it. Gee whiz. Well, you know, there may be some people that like it when I have it off, but uh, I do want to thank Franklin Huey's showing you can make a, a, den a donation. Uh, even if it's through Dissident Science, that money uh, we put into the CMPS. So you can make donations online. You can also de make donations. And I want to thank, uh, we did get a donation during this uh, talk. Uh, people are liking it. So uh, we're going to have to bring you more because you are lucrative, lucratively uh, um, uh, important to us. Uh, but I thought here here is really something talking about uh, continuity and discontinuity. I'm going to bring us up a little closer. This would be interesting because of my position of getting out there and supporting people. Because you know, my my goal is not to say what's right or wrong. I just have this great empathy for anybody who goes out there and tries to th think critically against the mainstream. That to me is is 
is huge already. And because of that, I often get books out of the blue. And this is one of them that is absolutely fascinating. I don't know if you can see the cover, but it says the discontinent continuity of motion. Now, where did this come from was even more 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 interesting. I think this guy is in Can is from Canada. And he was a scientist, I think in the in the 1950s. And what he did was to he was into um, um, the uh, motion of care of of looking at high speed film. So he would look at things that were going to uh, he could capture as movement. And I there was there's was another book that I he sent uh, his I think his son sent. And basically what he was saying is if you take where something is now and then move it a little bit further to where something else is, this whole thing of like this this uh, philosophical problem, like if you go halfway to a, a place, you'll never get there. But he really, after doing um, high speed photography, where he captured literally, I, I don't know if he was part of the ones where you'd see a bullet going through like, you know, an apple or something at that time, way before we have the machinery we have now, which is much, much more capable. But it got him thinking that is motion and time basically uh, continuous or is it discrete? Uh, what's your thoughts on that? Um, I haven't really tackled that in depth, but um, I think of time as being a physical process. So in that sense, um, uh, it's perfectly natural to think of it as discontinuous. Okay. Okay. All righty. So I know we have some people in there. I know Franklin Hugh popped in. Usually he doesn't do that by accident. So let's bring in Franklin. Hey, Franklin, how you doing? Great. Great to see so, you. Nice Hi, talk. Franklin. Oops. Oop. I got it. Wrong person. I'm, I'm, I'm. Okay. Hi, Franklin. <laughs> Okay, I think we're having a little bit of technical problems. So, uh, yeah, Nick, so I had some questions. Uh, great talk. And, uh, yeah, I did make that $5 donation just to check it out. Um, although you can't do a super chat on uh, the John Chappelle channel. So, uh, Dave, you might want to check that out. Uh, that has to do with the number of subscribers. Oh, does so, it? So what you need to do, folks, and that's a good uh, segue here, is please like and subscribe. You know it doesn't matter. It does matter. So I think when we get to a thousand, I'm not sure, a thousand subscribers, we'll be able to uh, uh, receive super chats directly from uh, YouTube. But you can still go to the the donation side, which we actually get more that way because the YouTube obviously takes their cut. But yeah, that'll give you the explanation. But go ahead, uh, uh, Franklin. We're talking about time and we're running out. We yeah, so I had minutes. some uh, questions on your presentation here specifically when you showed that uh, Maria chart and, and the two lines, and I just got completely lost about that. I mean, you and seem Darren. to be trying to imply that people could observe perhaps a, a different sequence or something that someone observed in someone's past looks like it is in someone's future, which that completely lost me. Because, you know, I'm figuring that, you know, if, you, if you're observing something like, say, the moon, and you see rock A hit the moon, and then you see rock B hit the moon. I mean, that's a definite sequence of events which defines a definite uh, past and present and an order of events. So, um, I mean, is that still true? Or or, or is it, it the difficulty here just that, you know, I, I absolutely don't believe in uh, removing time or relativity of time or that things could be observed in different orders. Uh, so yeah, I, I was totally lost there. So we could try and clean that up. Okay, I think um, because you're talking about two rocks hitting the moon, you're talking about two events that are relatively close, but the farther those events get replaced from one another, some people can see them in the past. Uh, you know, the second one in the past um, and you might be seeing the first one is simultaneous to your present state, but someone moving with respect to you will see uh, the rock hitting the moon as being in the future of your time because his view 
of space time is distorted. Uh, well, it's different. No, I think you have different. to explain that one sentence because okay. I don't see that being at all possible. Oh, which part? That someone could observe something happening. I don't know in my future. I mean, uh, or he past. sees he. All right. <laughs> This is a Minkowski diagram, and Minkowski diagrams were supposed to be um, a direct graphical interpretation of Einstein's equations for special relativity. So here we have Maria at location A, and she sees event X as being simultaneous with her current position. So but, exactly what would that mean in terms of, like, what does that mean? Like, like put it in terms of the, the moon hitting the rock um, example. What would that mean for Maria? Is it like Maria sitting on the moon and she sees rock hit moon? What is that? Well, now she's on our earth and she's looking through a telescope and she sees a rock hit the moon. Okay, we can deal so with that. She That's see, good. So she sees and she understands, she's not naive. She understands that it took so many seconds for the light to travel from the moon to the earth to, and to her telescope. So, but for her, her view of the, uh, of space time, that hitting the rock was uh, equivalent to her um, clock hitting 10 o'clock in the morning. But Freddie, who's traveling relative to that, to, uh, so let's say Maria, Freddie, wait, 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 let me do something, right? Um, Freddie is traveling relative to Maria. We'll see that if the moon hits the rock simultaneous with, let's say, 12 o'clock noon in Maria's time, which is in the future of Maria at the time that she's looking at this in the uh, well, how is that telescope. Possible? Because that's that's right. How is it possible? Your I think your question at... your question really is how does relativity make sense? This is a portrait of the consequences of relative simultaneity, and you know I know a lot of people have, have uh, the view that uh, you know things are simultaneous or they're not simultaneous, and I kind of agree with that. I think there is a physical simultaneity, which I'll discuss in part two or three. So I think it's not so much when I'm discussing special relativity, I'm not endorsing it. I'm just telling you this is this is the consequence of uh, of the special relativistic view, where all inertial uh, observers' views are supposed to be equally valid physics, even though they contradict one another. And Lee was saying himself, this uh, you know. Special relativity's consequences, it gets rid of um, an absolute or a global present, past, and future. Everything is relative to the observer. And I agree with you. It's difficult to well, it agree, may be with, my agree with that view. <laughs> understanding this, that it just seems completely absurd. I mean, yes. if, if you take everything from an observational standpoint, yes. then I could say that, you know, I, I'm putting my fingers here and I'm squishing your head. Because yes. your head would only become like you know half an inch, right? But that well, well, that's perhaps a little extreme. But I I agree with you. I'm I understand your your question and saying I have the same questions about relativity. But I'm presenting what relativity says, and and, and not in my words, but in uh, Lee Smolin, who loves relativity, but recognizes your, your, your the same is that, problem. Is that is that Lee is like uh, the the guy who put the planets around the sun, but not the earth around the sun. Is that, you know? I actually say that in part two, I think, that he, he has made a step in recognizing a problem. Relativity removes time from his physical view or has everything as time relative to, to observers. And I'm saying that's a good first step. And the second step is to get, you know, a theory that, uh, properly in, incorporates the essence of time but he hasn't made that second step yet yes i agree with you uh, yeah although i still would disagree with the concept that you're trying to remove time i mean i would say that 
you know, the relativity is trying to move, I don't know, absolute time, but you cannot get rid of the uh, concepts of past and say future or the order of events, right? Because I'm thinking that, you know, and then moon, rock A hits, then rock B hits. I mean, no matter who you are, no matter where you are, uh, those will have to be observed in that order, which preserves past and future. Well, actually, I don't know. It doesn't really preserve, preserve yeah. past and future. I guess it preserves the, the order of events. Yeah, I guess, I guess uh, the problem with your example is that you tend to see them as pretty close together. But as you get further apart, no, you don't see them in the same order. No, I think you would. I mean, no, no. matter how far <laughs> According to relativity, if you're a relativist. If not you're if caught, you're you got to remember, this is relativity, frankly. Yeah, it's not so, It's not a discussion of whether it's right or wrong. Right. It just means well, you can come up. Any relativist to show me an example. I mean, you could put trillions of years between events and event A would still happen for event B by all, all observers, right? No, no. They no. can no. come up with a contradiction. No, that's that, that's. No. One of the problems with special relativity yeah. is, is Lee, who's a great champion of relativity, admits and says explicitly. Yeah. Okay. So we're in agreement. <laughs> yeah, we're in agreement. Frankly. It's it's a yeah, and we're not here really. I mean, I think the point is not to discuss how relativity screws that up and and how you know whether or not that's understandable. I think what the the most important thing is to to sort of give a, a, a historical con. Uh, uh, a concept of what's going on and just leave it at that because it, it would be like you know taking illogical logic and then saying going back in time and say okay they believe this and sit sit around with that model in your head and drive yourself crazy trying to find a corner in a round room so you know i think that's kind of what we're, we're getting here though did you yeah, have any other comments important to you know determine whether nick is for example correctly uh representing well, you know what uh, Lee or the relativists are saying, because right. It, so you we, have you well, dissidents. We put up like you know straw men, and it's like, and then we attack that straw man, and then which may not have any reality. Right. To okay. So I understand. What I understand is you're in disagreement with the idea that in relativity you can't have a future uh, happen at a different time from another person observing your. You, you're in, and, and that's I, you know, we can't we can't solve that right here. So, did you have any more uh, other comments, or was that pretty much uh, your question? No, yeah, because I was just confused about yeah. what the heck that meant, and perhaps my confusion is due to my complete uh, inability to dismiss logic. So, well, that's what, yeah. and we we both agree with you, yeah, uh, well, because yeah. lo special relativity, e even in parts of general relativity, it's just not logical. So, what can you do? So, you're right. I, I can ass assure you, um, Franklin, that my representation, really Lee's representation that I presented, is held by relativists, and is in the textbooks over and over again, and very explicit. And that's why so many people have. Uh, reactions like you that doesn't yeah. make any sense still doesn't make any sense every single time <laughs> i see stuff like that like, i know Ooh. but again we or I, what we don't want to do is sit here and go back in time and discuss for instance this is just sort of like the same discussion as to say what kind of mechanical w way i don't know if anybody's seen these clocks from like this 15th century where you have it it's traces out the pa uh, paths of the the uh the um uh planets which do like s kind of patterns yeah, we can discuss, you know, that whole model and how you make that and how complicated and it's just not, you know, or we can say, yeah, that's the way they did it. It's, it doesn't make sense. It's a lot harder and just move on. So yeah. I understand. I think, I think uh, Franklin will like my parts two and three because I'm of the same mind and will be saying, hey, it's taking time out of physics leads to a lot of contradictions. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. See, well, we'll see. So common since sense. my personal my personal opinion is that time is quantized, that uh, that there is an actual global universal, say, clock that everything yeah. moves by is my personal opinion. Yeah. OK. All righty. We will. Uh, let's go on. I think. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I, I do. I think there's somebody here. Um, of course, we're going to have people that I disagree here. Let me see yeah. here. Um, there was something here. Time is a relative construct based on the time of clock. Um, 
uh, here, here, um, this was a comment, I think. Um, again, we're discussing the history more, which is okay. I mean, this is discussion of history. He says, Franklin is right, special relativity preserves cause and effect. Some fundamental flaws in understanding of relativity are uh, relativity on display here. So, uh, <laughs> let me say that again, um, Lee was very explicit about that, and I had that as one of the uh, points in my summary that, as he said, rel the relativistic view, the observer-centric view, right. does remove uh, uh, cause and effect. Now, the nearer things happen, uh, and the nearer the observer is to the what's going on physically, the better he can discuss cause and effects, but there are limits to that in special relativity and in general relativity. Right, and it's right. admitted by the relativists. It's, you know, right. it's not a right. controversial think, point. Yeah, I think part of it is that people, you know, they you, you see a when you're looking at something as as absurdly complicated, right. really it is as relativity, especially special relativity, it's so absurdly com complicated. Is that you start you're it's really tough to stand back far enough to come up with a conclusion where uh, that time is not no longer part of that. Um, I think when again we get into the 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 minutia of of our interpretation of of of, of an absurd theory and concept, and we get caught up in that when we say, okay, like you're saying, look, me too. I mean, you, we can think ourselves into a corner. Uh, trying to to understand this, and I think one of the problems is is that if we don't get past it, we're not going to get to another solution or at least uh, you know move science forward. So it is it is complicated. I mean, the moment you try to think of all, like I said, here you go, put a put inertial frame on every moving thing and realize that every moving thing's made of atoms, and those are made of moving things, and there's electrons going around the nucleus, and those are moving. And then go calculate all the calculations you need in special relativity to find out the relationships of cause and effect. It's just, in fact, uh, in my uh, documentary movie, uh, do, um, Dr. Peter Marquar says that that was the problem of it, it's not a it, relativity is not a a, uh, a a theory about events. It doesn't care about the event. It cares about the observation, so it's quite interesting. Okay. Yeah, let me let me make just one final comment to Kev. Sure, about, absolutely. Uh, for him to think about uh, special relativity says that every inertial observer's view is equally valid regarding the physics of what's going on. Um, but all of these different views are contradictory and different than one another. So in that context, um, you can't really define cause and effect. Uh, you can if two observers are standing ne right near each other, but the farther they get separated, the more distortion as to um, their view, and the more difference their views are about cause and effect. And I will go into a rather detail on that in part two. Okay, we got. We do have a question. Uh, again, if you want a question or comment, if you do that, I uh, will put it up here. Is a question from Alstar Riddock for Nick. Would you consider what it would mean if the fundamental components of existence, whatever that may, be, are immutable, thus unchanging and eternally existent? Um, trying to figure out. Uh, I don't have any problem with that view. Um, I think I think there's a lot of evidence that over a long enough period of time everything changes, but I don't have any problem with people thinking about things being immutable or unchanging or eternally existent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Al okay. I think Alistair Rudick had another uh, point in the chat that I thought was interesting. But oh, okay. Well, do you remember which know. one? Let me uh, see uh, if if you let me see here. Okay, um, do we have people in the green room? We have anybody else? We have Jim Marison is in there. I think he's in there. Um, but uh, I think we've talked to everybody there. 
So let me see uh, if we have some more. Uh, I do have, let's see, how much time do we have left? We have 15 minutes. Let's see, Alistair, if you made yes. another point that we haven't discussed, why don't you repeat it so it'll come to the end of the chat yes. and I'd be able to see it. Yeah, that would be uh, fine. I, I do normally uh, star them. We have them star. But I see Jim Marison. Did you want to come up and say something? I know you worked yourself way in here, so I'm going to uh, bring him up here. I'll be looking for uh, uh, his uh, the other guy. Go ahead, Jim. Are you there? Hey, can you hear me? Absolutely. Great to hear you. Great to see you, Jim. Welcome. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I guess, uh, you know, for uh, people that study this kind of thing, uh, the biggest uh, problem is uh, the Marcus and Morley type experiments. Um, I wondered if you wanted to comment more about that. And I have some of my own comments. <laughs> That's how I start off part two. With okay. the Michael Morley uh, experiment and the effects uh, of that, because that's really uh, what what led to this wacky thoughts about time. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I I will talk about that in depth. Yeah. All right. Mark, so uh, I I just want to point out that um, there was an experiment uh, in uh, 1979 that. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, 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 that may have actually found a uh, a positive result for the Marcus and Morley the Marcus and Morley type experiment they did <clears throat> I did with uh, John Hall. Are you familiar with that? Does, does that show motion with respect to the constellation Leo? No, no, oh, it was okay. looking for that. That's the problem. Because oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> It it uh, it detected a, a possible motion of the uh, laboratory with respect to the ECI, but uh, oh yeah, yeah the the laboratory does move with respect to the ECI because the ECI is uh, the Earth centered inertial frame without rotation, and of course the lab rotates with the Earth, yeah, you know, the Earth's surface. Yeah, and the Michelson Gale experiment detected that. Yeah, as a first order uh, exp uh, phenomenon, but the Michelson Morley experiment, second order, and it's much more difficult to to detect that right that velocity because it's so small. Uh, <clears throat> I guess yeah, I'm not explaining explaining yeah. myself very well, but <clears throat> the point is that if if uh, a first order experiment can detect it and ring lasers detect it every day. Why not second order? And <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, the problem is that no, none of the experiments that are have been done recently that have the possibility to detect that um, <clears throat> have actually looked for that that motion. Uh huh. Yeah. <clears throat> and, good point. And that. Uh, <clears throat> The best way to actually find it, per perhaps, would be to repeat the Michelson Morley experiment in, in outer space, in, in uh, orbit, uh, local Earth orbit, or or even better, in interplanetary orbit. Right, right. So, so those are that's what we need to do. <laughs> okay. Do you have any more comments? Or and then questions? that would solve all the relativity. <laughs> Uh, yes. Stuff. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> okay. Um, any more comments? Well, uh, I'm glad you James? agree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, basically, I guess you're saying that we're going to be talking about that. That's an interesting point. I know I've asked you several times about are you, are you an etherist or not, and you're you're you, you you talk about it. You've studied it. You've looked at it in comparison to time historically. But I haven't, uh, even though, even in your bio, you talk about it. Is that more of a historical factor, or is that something that you yourself uh, adhere to? Uh, are we talking about ether? Ether, yeah, ether. Okay. Because I do know that, uh, how do you say, as, as Jim points out, and you're going to be talking about in your second talk, which is a good sort of segue, um, yep. that it, I was just curious on your point, because I've asked you a number of times, you said, well, it's, I'm not either way, but you look at it more historical. Has it been more historical for you? Do you have any 
uh, ideas or that's yes. just, yeah, yeah go yeah. ahead. Um, I, I believe that physics needs a preferred frame for measuring motion and for measuring how motion affects the rate of atomic processes. So I'm in common with Lorentz ether theory in that that's a preferred frame theory where the preferred frame is the ether rest frame. I haven't seen enough, you know, detailed data about what the preferred frame is other than it's the GCI frame in the local, in the locale of the earth. So I am a preferred frame uh, backer, strong backer, and that's compatible with ether theory. Mm -hmm. But right. I, I, I have no, I don't see any empirical evidence to say that that preferred frame must be the ether. Okay, I got you. Okay, that makes when, that makes more sense. Yeah, I, I do have some, I think, brand new ideas that I will bring to the ether debate, whether you know, that you talked about earlier. Yeah. Oh, good. Well, then I'll, I'll bring you in because I, uh, that it's going to be, it is interesting to me because I think, you know, until, for instance, um, I guess there's lattice theories. I don't know anybody who's really developed that a lot. Believe it or not, um, you know, who was sort of a proponent of lattice theory was um, Ron Hatch. Ron Hatch with the GPS. He had this real feeling he, he i asked him i said i i think you know there's this kind of lattice in in the universe and that that you know sort of was how do you say satisfying to him as to you know to look at this preferred frame or or, or idea there especially with gps he had over 30 patents in gps right uh, and then of course you know i mean one of my contentions is the reason people look at ether is because they look at light like looks like a wave it acts like a particle but it, people are just can't get away from the wave aspect uh we see an ether medium could be a, an explanation for that and that's where they land although there are now there are at least three different uh, models out there so okay so your your contention is yes uh, there is some universal thing out you know some universal frame quarter like um i guess um Bor um uh Karazani said and i i quoted i read his work his mathematical work for a number of years until i came to the conclusion that what he was saying is there's not you can't have more than one frame all you can do is move the origin from which you measure and i think it's kind of in in, in the same vein so uh that's yeah i i i use frame as a shorthand it's to talk about, but it's motion with respect to some other physical entity yes. that's yes. key. But that means yes. that the preferred frame is as a local reality. And if yes. you're on Jupiter, it might be the JCI frame. That's the preferred frame in the locale of, of Jupiter. Well, even, right. And even the perception. Yeah. I mean, one of the things is even with life forms, we can see it. That is, the bigger a life form is in, in our local world, it seems mm -hmm. that slow time is a different yeah, it seems you look at ants; they're not they're moving at a, a an incredible speed, <laughs> and and I mean it's it seems trivial, but th in some sense you can see that you know um, I know that my father and I talk about time, and and one of the things we say when people ask us about it, I say it's sort of a kind of an invention we use to be able to describe motion and make predictions of things about motion really. Um, that's what it's about, um, you know, whether or not that thing is there, you know, that you can point to it, but it, it's certainly tied to motion quite a bit. So um, I think that's... Um, I addressed that in part three. In part three, there you go. I mean, uh, this is this is great. I mean, I didn't, you know, you, you really know you're an uber nerd when this is like, <laughs> this is just like really great. I, I, this has been a very popular... Uh, presentation we have about uh seven minutes left now um i'm going to ask you because i know you've been doing these uh talks and things but you yourself um when you were looking at this 
task to look at really the history of time. It, it seems to be really related. This is sort of a meta thing, so we don't have to get into anything, but it, you, it seems to be an inextric inextricably linked to relativity. Is that more of a historical thing? Or if someone didn't come along and come up with this idea of, you know, time dilation and all this stuff, would that have happened? Or is it just a, a historical artifact from the human race that we had an Einstein come along and, and do this and sort of got us off track in some sense? Well, in part two, I go into depth about the transition from Lorentz ether theory to relativity. And um, I, I, it was not a historical necessity. It um, could have been skipped over. So, so what you're saying I, is, if, if I saw this on Einstein's Facebook page, it says, "What if Einstein didn't exist?" Of course, my comment was, "Oh, I, we would have advanced <laughs> much, so much further in science yes. if he." And that's not what they were expecting. But it, so you're you you basically, if I understand your answer, is yeah, this is this is yes. a historical artifact that has really thrown these monkey wrenches in so that people like Franklin Hugh, myself, yourself, sit there and try to understand this when we get it into, uh, into college and we get this course on special relativity, and it's really been a distraction. So, Yeah, my view is from a historical point of view, there was a natural progression and then Einstein came along and without any real rationale for doing it, as I alluded to earlier, went down uh, a dead end street. And now we have to come back to where he made this wrong turn and then we can now make uh, progress. That's my, that's my historical view. Okay. Yeah, that's that's mine. It's I think there's a lot of people and, and that question if he wasn't around how much time you know where would we have been? Where did you know where could we be in the future. So um, uh, again, we'll be talking um, uh, summary wise, we're going to be getting two more talks. It won't be next week, folks. We do have a, a, a Lin Tao next week, but um, the week after uh, we'll be getting the uh, two weeks from today, we'll be getting the uh, talk, uh, the second talk. Uh, won't you give one more time uh, summary for those maybe who just joined uh, what you're going to be talking about uh, two weeks from today? Okay, we'll talk about how MMX, the Michelson-Morley experiment, forced Lorentz to make three changes uh, to uh, Lorentz ether theory to uh, coincide with the alleged findings of the Michelson-Morley experiment. And uh, what Einstein really did was to just flip those three things on, the, on its head without any justification. Uh, to go down a uh, dead end street. Okay. All righty. Well, listen, uh, I want to thank you, first of all. It's not not easy. I've asked numbers of people in certain areas, expansion tectonics for is one of them. And I have people writing books on the history of those things. And they say that's just too big of a endeavor to do. And to look through all of history and, and uh, put down sort of a a new uh, evolving, you know, as we say in our, our talk uh, or, or in our title of these series, an evolving view of, of the history of science. It's not an easy endeavor, but I, I do want to thank you uh, greatly. I do want to put up here for everyone to, again, please support everyone. Support Nick. Nick has a, a, has a uh, YouTube channel. Uh, this 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 talk he has will be on that YouTube channel. He's got a lot of videos. I've watched them all. They're really great. We make sure you subscribe to them, um, that you like the videos. In fact, if you're watching this, please click the like. Why? Well, more people will come in this direction because um, I do greatly appreciate I appreciate everybody's support. And thank you, Nick, so much for this uh, talk. I mean, uh, I, I know there's a lot of questions that we I probably didn't get to. But uh, maybe someday we'll get enough money, we'll have production people. <laughs> and I have okay. to thank Lee Smolin for his yes. excellent book. And uh, he is a, definitely a critical thinker. I just, yes, uh, he is. you know, needed him about. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and it didn't, didn't he bound to relativity. Yeah, didn't he write also uh, uh, Stephen Hawking's Smoking My 
like socks or something like that. <laughs> I, I guess so. I, I don't I don't remember that. Specific. Yeah, I think it was a very strange book. But if you look him up, uh, yeah. But absolutely, he's a critical thinker, and it's just yeah. you know I know lots of critical thinkers that are I I think myself are going to go down in history, but for one reason or other on another topic in critical thinking, they're pretty much mainstream. So again, I want to thank you so much, Nick, for your time and your efforts, and we're really looking forward to those uh, future talks. Remember, folks, nick.naturalocity.org. Go to his website, and we'll see you in two weeks here. And I thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. All right. So again, uh, please support him, nick.naturalphilosophy.org. That's not his uh, web address. It will get you there. It's a shortcut called the subdomain shortcut. That will get you there. So greatly ap appreciate it. And I do want to thank everybody. If you want to make an o a donation, you can. Uh, someone says it's hard. It isn't that hard. If you're used to the internet, you can go to membership.naturalphilosophy.org. Click on one button and just fill in your information. Uh, you can take a credit card. Uh, I think you even do bank accounts, depending on what it is. You can also become a member. It's very important. It's very vital to this. You're not going to find anything like this anywhere, nowhere. So I want to thank everybody for their support. And we're going to head on our way out. And remember next week, folks, it's going to be three hours later. The good thing is in if you haven't, go to uh, naturalphilosophy.org. If you go to there, let's see here, go to the website. Um, here we go. If you go to naturalphilosophy.org, they're right at the top right hand corner. There's a subscribe. Put in your email. We will we do emails twice a week for these talks and we even send you a link that will tell you right what time it happens in your part of the world so um you do want to uh, subscribe to that and uh, you'll get more information you'll be more alerted to when this happens you can also simply subscribe to our youtube channels and hit on that little bell and that little bell there will tell you when we go live i get it on my watch and i go oh it's time so Thank you so much. I hope you've really enjoyed this. This has really been a, a great day. And let's take it all the way out and on our way and close this down. Yeah, I know my hair is gray. I got to update those things. But remember, like I say, always say, stay critical, stay thinking. I'm David D. Hills, your science therapist, trying to get you the promised land of becoming a critical thinker. Ciao for now.